not a 19, 20 year old or even a lieutenant that should be investigated. This is the system. This is the government. This is the policy. Alternate Focus interviews Akai Sharon and Noam Kayut, both veterans of the Israeli Defense Forces. All young Israelis, male and female, with few exceptions, are required to serve two to three years of active military duty in the Israeli Defense Forces. Sharon and Kayut served during the Second Intifada, a four-year-long bloodbath that claimed the lives of over 3,000 Palestinians and 950 Israelis. After thorough introspection, these young men have chosen to speak out about their experiences as self-described brutal occupiers of a disputed land. And Sharon and Kayut are not alone. They are members of a new forum for young Israeli Defense Forces veterans called Breaking the Silence. Now a worldwide exhibition, Breaking the Silence features photo and art displays and live speeches. Now, Sharon and Kayut share their stories. that my unit was given and carried out were arrest operations, search operations, going into taking over cities or towns or villages, uh, of course in the night time, and uh, sometimes you would continue in the same place for a few days, searching, going from one house to the other, searching them, taking over houses as observation points, or uh, arresting people. And that's your routine. My routine was or our routine was that we never knew where we we're going to be from one minute to the other. One night we could be in Nablus, the next night we could be in Gaza, the next night we could be in Hebron. And at a, there, at a certain point you just lose track of where you are, who you are, and, and what you're doing because you go into, you disrupt people's lives on a daily basis. And for me that was the most um, I think when I look at it today, when I reflect on it today as someone who couldn't do that during your service, because you can't really live in a you know, denial uh, way of life where you can't look at what you're doing, you can't really reflect on it. But when I reflect on it today from, from this perspective, I can say that that was probably for me the, the deepest uh, example of corruption. Not the extreme cases where it was shooting or stuff like that, but just thinking that there were hundreds of thousands of, of families that couldn't have one peaceful night of sleep in their homes. I mean, who, of, who in, in today, in, in the USA, in Israel, and anywhere else, would be willing to live like that? Not knowing if at 2 o'clock in the morning, 20 soldiers will take over your house for a week. Not knowing, sitting in your, in your living room and suddenly hearing... Uh, uh, smashing on the wall and and there is a hole in the wall and suddenly 20 soldiers come to visit and um, and for me that was routine in the newspaper I saw uh, just uh, an article about uh, conf conf confiscation car keys confiscation um, when you detain car uh, during to, to enforce curfew when you detain cars because they just passed the line that um, close to a checkpoint, whatever. And it's not the article and the soldier that brought out uh, more or less 100 uh, car keys and brought it, brought it to the press, but the the response of the spokesman, sir, of the IDF, the spokesman of the IDF that said, um, this is an extreme case, a rotten apple, it will be checked, uh, examined, and won't happen again. And now I gave the order to take. Palestinian car keys and to detain cars hundreds of times in my unit. I saw in the West Bank boxes full of car keys and, and IDs that were taken and were supposed to be returned but and then I know my father read the newspaper before me and I know that he believes 
I mean, he's from the from a different generation, where things maybe were better, or when people could believe the system, and he really thinks that this is an extreme case that would wouldn't be that won't happen again. And for me, that was it was a point a point of understanding that I'm not back for what I did. And I didn't do it for fun. I got my orders. I thought it was okay. I thought I was a part of <coughs> a system that protects Israel from terror attacks. And and then I understand that it's you know it's just a game of keeping information inside and not letting anybody know. And how can you criticize? How can you ask questions? And that was maybe one of the first times that I asked what's going on here. Um, one time in uh, when we finished an operation in Ablus and um, and it was really destructive. We were five or six days straight in Ablus with a lot of IDF forces, tanks, and APCs, and it was very destructive. I mean, the whole infrastructure of the city was torn up. Uh, there was a lot of houses that were uh, either damaged or even destroyed, and there was a lot of shooting. Uh, mostly by the IDF into the city and when we got out of there the first, the first thing that happened when we left the city got back to the army barrack was I heard a radio news flash which happens every hour in Israel and it was going like IDF forces left Nablus after a search and arrest operation and found this and that and that's it and I think that even then, I suddenly realized my parents are now sitting at home. They're listening to the radio. And they're sure that here we are, their heroes, their son, they sent, found weapons and ammunition and did this and, the, and, and that and so important things to defend this country. But they don't know the truth. They don't know that 99% of what we did there was destroy people's property, destroy their lives. But they, no one told them that. And I think, like Noam, when he just realized what the, you know, where the truth is and where it's going, I, I, today I can say that that was one time that I really uh, started to think of how the reality is being kept, you know, under the surface, hidden from the public. You hear the radio or uh, news and TV saying IDF forces return fire to sources of fire. Now you know that you were sh that we were shooting everywhere. You know that there is no such thing in daylight sources of fire in urban areas, and in nighttime. You know that you can't really, from a barrack far away, you can't really see uh, most of the time like the the exact place you're shooting at, and and that sources of fire, which as a soldier you know that it's just a title, good for the news, but and and this dissonance. We didn't hear it while serving. I want to give you one example of something that we've exposed also in, in the press in Israel and in foreign press a few months ago about a revenge attack that was launched by the IDF after one night in February 2002 two uh, terrorists from the Islamic Jihad uh, uh, attacked an IDF checkpoint and killing, killed six uh, IDF soldiers. The same night, the same night, the chief of staff, the minister of defense, not some sergeant at a checkpoint, you know, this is policy right from the top, decided to launch a revenge raid against Palestinian officers, some of them just traffic officers, all around the West Bank and Gaza. The next day, 15 Palestinian officers were, kid, were dead, were reported dead. And we spoke with four five different five different soldiers and officers in two different units that were part of these raids and part of the attacks on two on, on four different checkpoints in different areas geographically had no connection whatsoever to the place that was attacked by the uh, the night on the IDF checkpoint no connection one was in Nablus one was near Ramallah and they just attacked and the orders were just go there, shoot to kill. And in the briefing by the commanders, by the high ranking commanders, commanders of units, brigade commanders, they were told to, that this is revenge. We are going to revenge the blood of our soldiers. So when you ask me where it comes from, this was not some spontaneous um, 19, 20 year old kid that loses his, his, his 
mind that, that, you know, went out of control for a second and slapped someone. This was policy. People sat down in offices, convenient, comfortable offices, and decided to kill people as revenge. And the next day, 15 people were reported dead that had no connection whatsoever to the attack on the IDF. So when we have to, and, and we exposed this. And then, you know, we weren't expecting something dramatic to change because when people ask me, don't you think something should happen? Of course I think something should happen. But do you really think that the Israeli public or someone will be brave enough to say that the Minister of Defense has to be investigated? That the Chief of Staff has to be investigated? This is not a 19, 20 year old or even a lieutenant that should be investigated. This is the system. This is the government. This is the policy. The story behind Breaking the Silence and what it's trying to do is that one day in uh, March 2004, a uh, young guy, a month before his discharge, um, woke up in the morning and found out that he can't look at himself in the mirror. That guy's name was Yehuda. Yehuda Shal. He's the founder of Breaking the Silence. And he started to talk with his friends, with people that were his soldiers, his commanders, especially about Hebron. He served 14 months in Hebron in the Second Intifada. And that evolved into a uh, exhibition of uh, pictures taken by soldiers, not photographers, not journalists, just pictures that, you know, 18, 19 year olds took for memories. And we took that out of photo albums, presented over 60 of them with over 60 soldiers giving video testimonies about their Hebron service. And that evolved from there to what it is today, a much, much, much bigger group of uh, soldiers that served all around the occupied territories as conscripts or as officers in the Second Intifada. And we've interviewed over 300, mostly discharged, uh, some still in service, soldiers uh, in the IDF. And the message, or what we're trying to do with all this, is when we were discharged, the, the first thing, the fundamental thing that we all felt was the amazing distance or gap of information between what is really going on in the occupied territories, what we're really doing over there, and what is known back home to our parents, to our neighbors, to our public figures and leaders, what is told by the press, what is told by the IDF, and we felt a moral obligation as much as a social obligation as people who grew up in Israel, did their military service, who love their country, and are very, very concerned about how we will look tomorrow, how we will raise our children tomorrow, because we don't want to see ourselves anywhere else. And um, out of that concern, we felt the moral obligation of bringing that information, the true stories of what we're doing in the occupied territories, to the public and raising a true public debate on all platforms, press, politicians, everywhere you can think of um, about the real corruption, the moral corruption that is happening in the occupied territories, the price of sending more and more generations to be occupiers. Breaking the silence <coughs> tried to fight a code of silence which has many aspects. First of all, and, and the most important one as we see it, is the personal one. When you stand in a post or in a checkpoint, and I commanded <coughs> Kalanga checkpoint between Jerusalem and Ramallah, where almost 3,000 Palestinians cross every day, and your job, even if you don't want to do it, you stop people from living the, the, the life that they should have. They, you stop, you take their freedom to go to work, you take their freedom to go to mm -hmm. university, and many times, even if you don't want to do it, you humiliate people, you make them stand in line for hours, and when you go back home after a month of doing it, you have a weekend break, you don't come home to your girlfriend or to your mother and say, hey, the day before yesterday I saw somebody more or less your age, mommy, and I let her wait in the sun for five hours because I didn't have a permission to let her pass. I mean, that daily life of occupation, of controlling people, 
is the first aspect of, of, of the silence call. Breaking the silence is a personal process. It's something, first of all, it's not an easy thing to look at yourself in the mirror and, and, and see what you really have done and, and, and the other side. It's, it's, very, it's a very good feeling to feel a hero, to talk about the fights, the times that you were fighting terrorists and that you saw them and, um, but realizing the damage for the population, realize the hatred that you've created is a hard thing. And <coughs> most, when we call people friends, when we have telephones from yeah, units in the army and we start calling to people, most of them say, you know, we kind of agree with what you're doing, some agree more, some less, but leave me alone. I mean, I've, I've served, I've done it, I've left the country for a year to forget about it, I, I'm back here, just let go. And so it's not that easy to get to people to get people to talk, even if they, if even if they agree with the total idea. But we've, uh, as Avichai said, we've interviewed over 300 soldiers, and and you need to understand that's not a one-hour interview, it's um, or TV interview. People, someone tells you about two years or three years out of his life. It's uh, important to understand the two different aspects of, or two different types of testimonies that we've collected until now. In the first few months, most of the testimonies that we uh, exposed uh, were testimonies on the routine daily brutality and individual or group corruption that happens, humiliation, abuse, theft, uh, looting, uh, things that for Israelis mostly, but I think for any person that wants to deny, uh, can say rotten apples, extreme cases, uh, people that uh, um, broke the law, broke regulations, and should be uh, convicted or prosecuted. And it does. It, it sometimes doesn't even matter that you tell them. Well, these are stories about units, about hundreds or thousands of soldiers. And that was something that we we. Um, were exposing for a long time and the last campaign that we did was a collection, a massive collection of testimonies on policies, procedures, orders, you know, things that can't be very easily swept under the rug and, and called rotten apples because they are the system. And uh, the main issue that we were addressing in this campaign was the r were the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement in Israel are classified the in this intifada are not even written down, uh, even though in past times the IDF used to issue or distribute pocketbooks with the rules of engagement in the occupied territories to every conscript and reservist. In this intifada, not only didn't they distribute this, it is all passed down orally. There is no document written down that is passed down to the officers in the field or the soldiers. And we have decided that especially because the most uh, dominant thing or dramatic thing that has happened in the Second Intifada is the casualties, is that people are being killed and children, uh, regular people, innocent people are being killed and, um, and it, it has been much more violent on both sides both on the Israeli side with the suicide bombers and both on, on the Palestinian side with all the actions that are being done by the IDF and um, we've exposed a massive collection of those. I think, for me, the one that sticks out the most is an officer from an elite unit telling us about his experiences in Rafa. And he tells, his testimony is very, very long, so I won't say it all, but he ta talks about two main issues. One is the demolition of houses, and he describes now in the briefing, they were told that the procedure is you don't go into Rafa on foot because it was right after the APCs blew up, if you remember, that was in, in, in the summer of 2004 and it was very hectic and you couldn't walk by foot, so you come with APCs, tanks and bulldozers, D9 caterpillar bulldozers, giant monsters, and before you even say something to the family that you're going to take their house, before you do anything, the, the D9, the bulldozer, digs a uh, eight meter uh, uh, digs eight meter deep uh, ditch surrounding 360 degrees surrounding the house then he punches a hole 
You don't say anything to the family. You just punch a hole into one of the walls. And then the APC comes right up to the, to, to the, to the family's home and you lower the ramp and the soldiers go in. And I was asking him, who's deciding which houses? And, and then he des describes to me how they demolish, how they destroy every house in that area that bothers the, their uh, observation, that might be threatening everything. And I ask him, who is given, who decides what to destroy? And he says, well, the officers in the field. And you have to understand, these could be lieutenants, 21-year-old lieutenants, decide what to destroy and what not to destroy. And then when I ask him, and no one told you criteria of what you can and what you can't, I mean, if the officer decides that he doesn't like, I don't know, a yellow house and the house is yellow. I'm exactly the words that I used. And he says, well, if he doesn't like yellow, he can destroy it. And it's that easy. And I think for me, that was an amazing... It's still, I, I, it's still something that I carry every day because it's, it's exactly how the procedures, how the policy are so corrupt from the start that when they are carried out in the field, the amazing power that you have as a 19, 20 year old soldier carrying out these policies, these procedures on the field are just so tragic or so, are, are disastrous. First, I'll give you, I'll quote my Ministry of, uh, of Foreign Affairs of Israel that said that the public opinion of the the public opinion in the U.S. is the most powerful weapon that the IDF has, or that the Israel has, and I think in this case he's right. And I think that the public opinion here and the society here immunes us and enable us to do many things that, that in, my, in my opinion uh, are bringing to our social destruction and I can give you another extreme <coughs> example which uh, a soldier that Arichai uh, interviewed, right? Um, one of us interviewed, and he's in a unit that uh, engineer unit. They're actually what they're doing is to blow up things, bridges, houses, um, and the idea didn't use them at the beginning of that. <coughs> the first time they used them was 9/11. Ten minutes after the the airplane hit the tower, the first airplane hit the tower. They were on the way to Jenin to blow up houses. Why is that? I can tell you what he says, the soldier that was interviewed, the big brother wasn't looking, wasn't watching. So that's how much things are connected. And I think we realized after the second campaign, that uh, after the, the campaign of the rule of engagement of and, and the systematic uh, reason for uh, innocent casualties, we realized that it was public. It was well publicized, but it didn't bring up any real debate in society. And because this is, there are many reasons. Uh, the most, the, the most powerful one, I think, is that is. These are things that you can't criticize. I mean, you can't classify as rotten apple. It, it's hard for society to to face. And and I think we we realize that we that there is a bigger game going on, that uh, that we're not the only player in this uh, uh, in this game and that's why, that's, what, that's why we're here. I, I think, um, just to add one thing to know, that the, the, the public opinion of the United States is, is as he said, something that's, that enables us to continue this reality and just like we're doing back home, trying to force sometimes this truth, the stories, onto the Israeli public so they'll be aware of them. Um, it's exactly what we came here to do, is to bring this to the homes of the American society. Jews, Americans, 
and all Americans to tell them this is what is really going on. It's about time that you know what you're enabling. It's not going to stop with us. If you don't stop it now, it's going to be you 